Hey guys, my guest today, Matthew Lewis, is going to be talking about Richard III and the Two Princes. See you in about five minutes. Grab your popcorn and snacks, find a comfy spot, take a seat or lie down, and let me transport you to a place of fantasy, ghost stories, ancient legends, odd creatures, alien encounters, and other magical topics. You may even decide to join the conversation. From faraway lands to your own backyard, 
with a small dash of pixie dust. Turn out the lights and open your minds. The journey is about to begin. Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? Monday. Yikes. Wow. These weeks are going fast. Uh, probably starting on Wednesday. This will be the last couple days that I that I'm in here without the air conditioner on. So I have to reset all my sound settings to accommodate. Anyway, I want to thank you all for coming. My name is Charlotte. I'm going to be your host for the next hour. I'm also the owner of the California Haunts Paranormal Investigation Team based out of Sacramento, California. We are 45 strong up and down the state, which means if you have a paranormal issue, we definitely can get to you. It might take us a while. Hang on one second. Let me double check my settings. Okay. It might take us a while because California is this huge state. People don't realize how how big California is, but California is this huge state. But in that case, we have psychics, psychic mediums on staff who can call you and talk to you about you know what what what, is, may, what may or may not be going on. And in most cases, they'll be able to calm the energy down until we get out there. And I'm not saying it's taking us a week to get anywhere. Maybe one or two days to get to you, right? Okay. So don't despair. Help is on the way. Okay, that being said, uh, if you're watching from Facebook today, please be sure to uh, hit that follow button if you haven't done so already and show me some love with some smiley faces and some thumbs up and all that stuff. Same thing with YouTube. If you haven't subscribed already, you might want to. I mean, ch check out the YouTube site, uh, California House Radio YouTube site, because there's more than 631 videos over there on varying topics. I don't like to cover paranormal every day. I'm a journalist, okay? I don't like to cover paranormal stuff every day. All right. I enjoy doing uh, other news stuff as well, like today's show is a perfect example of, of changing it up a little bit. Okay. Also, if you want to see us on TikTok, we're over there. So the available places we have at this point are Facebook to find me and find California Haunts. You can find California Haunts on Twitter. You can find Cal Haunts on Twitch. And you can find California Haunts over there at, uh, <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> TikTok. Yeah, TikTok. And I'm also on Instagram under Ghosty Gal. It's all lowercase. Anyhow, I got two classes I'm teaching. Well, one's, one's kind of not a class. One's kind of informational. On July 8th, I'm going to be teaching a ghost hunting, a real hardcore ghost hunting one-on-one -on -one class. Uh, my, my team, we're just getting, you know, starting to roll again after all the COVID and my sicknesses and everything else. So I'm looking to recruit some new members and I'm looking to recruit investigators, people that have uh, technical knowledge that, that, that can do some debunking in the field, uh, tech people to work with some, with some of the equipment. And I'm looking for an artist. I'm going to put this out there. I'm looking for an artist who can do caricatures. Okay. Because what I'm looking for is similar to what they do on X Files when they have the sketch artist sketch whatever the psychic is seeing. That's something I'm looking for right now because I would like to add that to my team. I've been wanting to add that for a long time. Which reminds me, I also want to add some psychic mediums on, on, onto the team too. So it's busy. So if you're interested in joining my team, okay, you have to go through that training. And the training's two to three hours. It's very intense on equipment and procedures because I, after all this time investigating, I like things done a certain way. So it's very intensive training. So if there's something you feel like you, you want to try and do, go over to the California Haunts Meetup page, sign up for that. I think I have two or three spots still left. Okay, it's an online course I'm going to be teaching through, through StreamYard. And, uh, yeah, and then if you uh, like what you hear, you, you know, and, and you like the course, then we will go on a ghost hunt, take you on a ghost hunt with us, or the team members will show you how things are done and then take it from there to see if you're a good fit. So check that out. Now, the following day on the 9th of July, uh, that's another, I'm not going to say class, but it's an informational thing. We've done a lot of investigating around the state of California. And uh, we know where all the haunted, a lot of the haunted hotspots are, and I want to share that with you because some, you know, you might be in a situation where you can't join a ghost hunt team or something, you know, something like that comes up. Well, this is your way because what I'll do is I'm going to I'm going to point you in the right direction to some of these places where you can go, technically ghost hunting for free, or you can go have lunch there and talk to the staff about their ghosts or whatever you want to do there, right? But for, uh, it's free unless you decide to buy lunch or stay the night in some of these places. So I'm going to give you a list of those. I'm also going to show you at the same time the evidence that my team has obtained from those places so that you can hear firsthand. All right. I want to tell the stories about them, too. So that's going to be on the 8th of June, and, uh, July. And uh, I'm sorry, the 9th of July. Is months. That's going to be on the 9th of July. 
So sign up over at the California Haunts Meetup. You know, go over there. If you haven't joined now already, be sure to join. It's all free. I make a lot of announcements over there for events like these shows. And, uh, yeah, sign up over there. Again, you go to Meetup, sign it. You know, sign up, go to Meetup or whatever. And look under events and you'll see the events there. Okay. That being said, today's show, uh, is li we're live today and I've got a great guest. And if you like the show today while you're watching it and maybe you're having lunch at work or, or uh, you're at home having lunch, whatever, and there's other people around and you happen to like the show, tell them to come on over and watch it. Say, hey, there's this real cool little show that's on and, uh, and I've been watching it and why don't you come over and watch that's how, that's how word of mouth gets out. And that's how we've done so well because we have the people with word of mouth. Okay. I'm out of breath now. That being said, my guest today is Matthew Lewis. And I am a history buff. Whether it's American history, uh, you know, I mean U.S. history, or whether it's, it's medieval history, or whether it's British history, I am a total history buff. And I've done, I've done, I've done research on Richard III and the, and the two princes. I've done research on them over the years. And I've seen a lot of the movies, the Vincent Price movie, and there's one in particular where Richard has like a chess set, and he's on this, and he, he, he either wants to get to the throne, so he's got all these people ahead of him, which would be the royal family lineage, right, ahead of him, and so he's bumping, he's, he's bumping people off as he's going, and every time he bumps someone off, he knocks them over on the chessboard, moves everybody up an inch, you know, up a spot. So uh, it's, it's a really cool movie. I can't remember the name of it, but, you know. So anyway, my guest tonight is going to be talking about King Richard III. We're going to learn all about him. Excuse me a second. Dehydration. We're going to learn all about Richard III, and maybe if we have time, we'll talk about the two princes. Okay, let me, let me bring him in. This is Matthew Lewis. Maybe. Oh, there's a the mouse. Ha-ha. <laughs> Good morning. Well, yeah, good morning. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. I'm very good. Thank you very much. Very glad to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm glad you came. Now that I'm out of breath, it's all good. Tell me about you. Uh, I am a medieval historian and an author. I have written biographies of Richard III and also his father, Richard, Duke of York as well as Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine and Henry III and various other things. I've written accounts of the Wars of the Roses uh, and the Anarchy, the other big civil war in the medieval period in England. Um, and But you know, the Wars of the Roses is my what I call my history home. That's where I'm most comfortable. Um, and I've always been fascinated by Richard III and the Princes in the Tower in particular, um, amongst the Wars of the Roses. So that's where a lot of my study focuses and a lot of my energy is spent fascinating you know how does one like you see you've always been interested in richard iii how does one get interested in richard iii i mean are you one of these people that that just like and i'm not not saying anything wrong because i do that too when i was in europe all i did was hit the castles because i wanted to see all that stuff is this is that what it is for you or it's just it's just a topic that that you like writing about that, that it's partly that i think i don't live too far away from Ludlow Castle, which is one that's, mm -hmm. that has strong connections to the House of York. It was owned by Richard's father. He was there a, a couple of times in his life. So I've always loved being there. Uh, but I think my real fascination with the Wars of the Roses started at uh, A-level, which is the, the exams that we study for at 17 and 18 in this country. And I had a fantastic history teacher. She was just brilliant. Uh, we did the Wars of the Roses, and she was great at just bringing it to life. And a fascination with it kind of stuck with me ever since. And I always remember when we got to the part of the Wars of the Roses where Richard III really begins to emerge, she sort of stopped and said, you know, from now on in, you need to think about the sources that you're reading. When were they written? Who wrote them? Why did they write them? What did they want you to believe or understand? And it struck me that it was odd she said that about this person in particular and not sort of the whole of the rest of the Wars of the Roses where it's arguably mm -hmm. just as applicable anyway. And I think that's that fascination has just stuck with me ever since. What do the sources really say about Richard and how close can we get to understanding what really happened throughout those kind of tumultuous months in 1483? Mm -hmm. And to what extent do we just rely on later stories reaching a pinnacle in Shakespeare of this guy being the ultimate baddie in history. Right. And I, I think as well, I'm 
I find myself fascinated by anyone that history presents as two dimensional. So anyone who's a goodie or a baddie, for me, nobody is really like that. There is depth in everybody. So anywhere that I see history portraying someone as just a villain with no redeeming features, I'm, I'm always drawn to, to look at that a bit closer. You think people's, um, you know, like in my own case, I've read books, of course, like you say, and I, I agree with you that you have to look at the source. I mean, Richard III, written by an American, what are they going to know, right? How long does it take you and, and, and how hard is it to do this research for these books? I think probably historians are in a much better place than they ever have been in the past, given the, the wide availability of lots of source material on the internet now. So it means you don't have to leave the comfort of your own desk to mm -hmm. see an awful lot of the source material that previous generations would have had to go and trawl through various libraries to find out. So there is um, a much easier way of getting to that research now. But I mean, I, crikey, I did my A-levels nearly 30 years ago. So that's how long I've been fascinated by this and mm -hmm. and interested in it and i think it's the wars of the roses more generally is one of those things that i think you can never know there's right. always more to learn there's always a new rabbit hole to dive down some local feud somewhere that had a big impact on the national event so it's just a constant rolling process of trying to understand what went on and i think all of that is background to understanding richard the third as well so everything that you learn about the wars of the roses informs your view of Richard III and how he behaved and why he may have done that. So tell me about Richard. What type of personality did, did, did he have? It's quite hard to see his personality. So when he becomes king, he's 30 years old. And I think I am always struck by how much of the story of Richard focuses just on his time as king. So from 1483 to 1485. But he, he was 30 years old when he came to the throne. And we know an awful lot about what happened to him in all of those 30 years up till then. For example, at, at nine years old, he's at Ludlow Castle, not too far from me. Mm -hmm. His dad, Richard Duke of York, is drawing in all of his men to launch a, a campaign against Henry VI to go and impose himself on government. And we have this situation where Richard passes um, his ninth, no, his seventh birthday, seventh birthday, during all of these preparations for, for what would become the Battle of Ludford Bridge, he's surrounded by all this excitement of a building army. His big brothers, you know, Edward and Edmund, who were a decade older than him. His dad, you know, at the head of all of this massing force. Then they march out of Ludlow and they quickly return because there's a royal army reportedly twice their size coming to confront them. Mm -hmm. And what, what eventually happens is that the Yorkist leaders, so Richard, Duke of York, his oldest sons, uh, Richard's uh, Richard III's uncle, the Earl of Salisbury, and his cousin, Warwick the Kingmaker. All of these men who he must have, I think he must have been impressed by and looking up to, kind of run away in the middle of the night. And they leave behind Richard, his brother George, his sister Margaret, and his mother, Cecily. And they're left to deal with the, the Lancastrian army, the royal army that then rampages through Ludlow and sacks it. So for a seven-year-old boy to try and understand why all of these men have abandoned you, to, to, to realise how quickly security can be whipped away from you when you're, you're powerless and you let things unravel around you. The following year, his father comes back and claims the throne of England. So now he's, he goes from being the son of a, a traitor, a man who's been stripped of everything, to being the son of the, the heir to the throne. And he's kind of fifth in line to the throne at this point. By the end of that year, his dad and his older brother Edmund have been killed at the Battle of Wakefield. His mom's put him in a boat with his brother George and a couple of servants. And, and they've been rowed out to sea and they end up in Burgundy. I mean, this was utterly bewildering for a boy who is still, you know, just eight years old. Right. right. Um, there is a lot going on around his, his kind of maybe abandonment. Mm -hmm. his lack of security during his childhood. He would eventually come back to England after a period in exile in Burgundy to find that his brother was now King Edward IV, but also that he's now second in line to the throne. There's only his brother George between him and the throne at this point. So that kind of constant turning of his fortune, you know, there's a big medieval um, belief in this idea of the wheel of 
fortune of fortune's wheel that it, it turns and people rise up but then they fall and they can be crushed beneath it and i think richard's childhood has lots of hallmarks of that so it's important i think to to think about the impact that may have had on him as a child he would surely have disliked insecurity and uncertainty he would have wanted to have as much control over his own life and the events around him as he possibly could because one wrong step one moment of of lacking that security could lead to exile or death mm -hmm. and i think lots of that continues into his his teenage years and and is lessened during his adult years when we see him effectively running the north of england for his brother edward the 4th when he's king and richard develops this incredibly good reputation for being a good lord he's considered a good master in the north people want to be associated with him they want to be members of his affinity and that's in spite of the fact that we can see him having some quite for the time quite novel views i think on the way that a lord should operate so there are several legal cases which are examples of richard championing the cause of the the man lower down the social scale against his social superiors and i think that that's quite novel for the time and it's quite unusual and i think it's a an aspect of richard's character that plays into part of the reason that he was unsuccessful as a king later on we know that he's he's very pious you know he has strong religious beliefs he founds a college in middleham and he sets out all of the rules for the ways that that should behave and i characterize his his religious beliefs as almost verging on puritanical you know, he believes that everybody, or he doesn't think the church is doing a good enough job of, of supporting people and encouraging them to behave properly. Mm -hmm. So as king, we know he writes to the bishops and tells them to get themselves involved in people's lives and help them to live better lives. So he, he's quite a multifaceted person. And I, and I think one of the most interesting things, and I will stop talking in a minute, I promise. Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> one of the most interesting right. things about Richard pre-1483 is that you simply won't find someone who is portrayed as a monster a cruel person someone who murders anybody threatens to murder anybody so what happens in 1483 is so at odds with that man that we can see growing and living for 30 years previously to that that i think there's room there to think did he really change that much or have we misunderstood what happened in 1483 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know like you said you just hit the nail on the head when I think of Richard III, I think of, I think of the violence, you know, him wanting to be on that throne and and all this going on. How much of that was true, and how 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 much of it was fixed, you know, was made up? The part of the problem with any attempt to understand what happens in 1483 is really our lack of evidence. So we don't know what Richard was thinking at, at the time, but we also lack evidence for some of the critical events to understand precisely what happened and why it happened. So any view of 1483 is always going to depend on what you already think of Richard. If okay. you if you come to this with Shakespeare's monster in mind, you will see this chain of events in which Richard is is playing on that chessboard and moving people around, eliminating enemies. You can read 1483 in that way. But you can also, I think to some extent, that is viewing all of it with hindsight if you see it as one chain of events. It's entirely possible that what was happening was a series of isolated things that that mm -hmm. could look connected later once he he becomes king. I mean, Richard, let's be clear, Richard is a medieval nobleman. He's a violent man. He grows up in the Wars of the Roses during a, a horrendously violent time. He as at, he's at the Battle of Barnet at the age of. OK, uh oh, lost him. All right, he's frozen up. We'll see what goes on. Um, well, that's a bummer. Okay, let's see what we can do this here. It's going to be like that today, huh? Okay. Either way, I want to go ahead and restart my end here and see if I can't get him back. Let's see here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so he's off right now. So let's let's wait a second, and see what's going on. Oh, sorry, did I disappear then? Uh, uh you froze up. The sorry, I think it's my internet playing up. Okay, all right, no sorry. problem. All right, go ahead. Um, so we know he's at 
at the battles of Barnet and Tewkesbury in 1471 at the age of 18, and he acquits himself very well, evidence mm -hmm. that he's trained in his teenage years to prepare for battle. Mm -hmm. Having said that, he goes from 1471 to 1482 with no kind of military involvement whatsoever. He's, he's governing the north of England. In 1482, he leads an expedition to Scotland on his brother's behalf, which, you know, he, he essentially, he marches all the way into Edinburgh and negotiates a, a, a deal and then marches out. And there's no kind of battle, there's no fighting, but he doesn't lose any men. It's considered by some, or by many, I think, a successful campaign, although there is a school of thought that says, you know, this was a waste of money and time and effort, albeit you know, he's ordered to do it by his brother. And then really Bosworth then is the next kind of military exposure that he has. And, and ultimately Bosworth is Richard's first battle as a commander and oh. he loses. So that's not a great record for him to have in those terms. Um, we do get this kind of spate of executions in 1483 as as things are, are milling around. We get particularly Hastings, um, Earl Rivers, Sir Richard Grey and Thomas Vaughan. Uh, you know, people tend to say that Richard wades through pools of blood to get to the throne right. of England. There, there, are, there are literally four people who, who are executed during this period. So I would argue that he wades through far less blood than a lot of kings who come to the throne of England during this period, not least his big brother, Edward IV, um, right. for whom thousands of men died on battlefields to make him king. Um, so I think we have to accept that Richard as a, a medieval nobleman is, is, is raised in violence. He grows up in the Wars of the Roses. He is surrounded by violence. Violence is a tool that is in a, a medieval nobleman's locker to be deployed. I would probably argue that you see Richard deploy it far less than you do a, a many of his contemporaries. Do you think that, um, you know, as, as he got older, you know, like, like you say, maybe something changed, you know, with his personality, but was he able to have a, you know, marry, have a family, have heirs or, or how, how that work? So even, even Richard's marriage story is, is complicated. He marries uh, a lady called Anne Neville, who is mm -hmm. the younger daughter of Warwick the Kingmaker. Mm -hmm. uh, so Warwick the Kingmaker is Richard's cousin. So, you know, this is fairly typical um, family marriages in the, the, the nobility. They marry around 1472. We're not entirely sure precisely what date they marry. Mm -hmm. And... As a result of marrying Anne, Richard acquires all of the lands and territories in the north, which will become the cornerstone of his um, his lands in the next kind of decade. Uh -huh. But the problem that Richard has when he he comes to marry Anne is is kind of twofold. So Anne is a widow already; she'd been married previously to the Lancastrian heir to the throne, Edward of Westminster, uh -huh. who was killed at the Battle of Tewkesbury, and uh, Anne's older sister, Isabel Neville, is married to Richard's older brother, George. And George and Isabel are, according to the Chronicles, are, are bent on keeping the entire Warwick inheritance for themselves. So they don't want Anne to remarry and have to share the inheritance. So Richard ends up kind of butting heads with his brother, George, over who should get what in the inheritance. And ultimately, Edward splits it in half and Clarence gets the Midlands lands around Warwick. And around those areas, Richard gets the northern portion, the, the Neville kind of heartland of the inheritance. It's oh, we know that Richard, sorry, sorry, ahead, we know that Richard knew Anne as a, a child. So he, uh -huh. he spends some time in the late 1460s in the household of his cousin, the Kingmaker. He's partly trained there, brought up to be a knight. And we know that he spent time with Anne. So we, we have definite evidence that they sat together at the same table at a feast for um, the Archbishop of York's enthronement. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, it's likely that they were around each other a fair bit at these Neville castles. So they knew each other. So that leads some people to suggest, you know, this was a love match. This is kind of almost a fairy tale love story. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of thing is impossible to see. And, and it's a little bit misleading to talk about in a medieval relationship. I think how the way that we can characterize Richard and Anne's relationship is incredibly successful. Whether they were in love or not is, is almost irrelevant. They spend more than a decade in the north of England 
being incredibly successful, very popular, doing what is considered by most of the time to be an incredibly good job of what they do. They have one son who is named Edward, because everybody has to be called Richard or Edward, you know. They had a very small baby book in the House of York. Um, even his date of birth is uncertain. It's quite often put in the early 1470s. It's more likely to have been around 1476, we think now. Uh, they don't have any more children, and we don't know that Anne becomes pregnant at any point after this right. again. So quite why that might be, we don't know. A medieval nobleman would, would generally have an interest in having more than one son, more than one child, if he possibly could. Given Richard's experiences as a child, perhaps he didn't want more than one child. Yeah, maybe. Perhaps Anne was unable to have any more children after the first mm -hmm. one. We're not, we're not sure entirely. So, yeah, you know, I think they have an incredibly successful marriage for, for 10 years or so. One child who um, ends up becoming Prince of Wales when Richard becomes king. Very interesting. And, I mean, the stories that have been written about him, you know, Shakespeare and the movies that have been done about him, how accurate are they? Do you think? I think they're not at all. <laughs> um, Shakespeare, it's such an anomaly with Richard III. Quite probably he wouldn't be as famous and popular as he is if Shakespeare hadn't made him such a compelling villain to watch. I, I love Shakespeare's Richard III, right. but I think people tend to forget that it's a piece of drama. Uh, I always liken taking Richard the Third, Shakespeare's Richard the Third, as a history lesson to to watching Downton Abbey or something and thinking that's it. I know factually now. I know what happened in the 1910s and 1920s because I've watched mm -hmm. Downton Abbey. Mm -hmm. okay. Shakespeare would have been writing for a contemporary audience, and lots of people will say that Shakespeare wrote his play because he was writing for the Tudors, so he wanted to impress them by making Richard the Third, from whom they'd taken the throne, a monster. I would argue it's it's a little bit more complex than that. I think what Shakespeare writes is a piece of contemporary political satire that is wrapped up in history. And I think his Richard III and a contemporary Elizabethan audience would have understood that they were meant to be seeing a man named Robert Cecil, who was the son of William Cecil, Lord Burley, who was Elizabeth I's closest advisor. So we know that Robert Cecil had kyphosis, which is the forward curvature of the spine, that Richard had scoliosis, the sideways curvature that gives you a slightly raised shoulder. Mm -hmm. Robert Cecil had kyphosis, that forward hunching of the spine, which Shakespeare's Richard III has. He's described right. as uh, you know, James VI will, and first of England will later call him his little imp. Um, he's considered a, a devious, nasty little man in many quarters. He arranged the succession of James VI of Scotland to the, the throne of England. And if, if Shakespeare was a recalcitrant Catholic or a lot of his patrons were Catholic, as a lot of people believe, then he would have been looking at Robert Cecil and thinking, here's a man who is wandering around. Everyone can see what he's doing. He's plotting a Protestant succession when we could return to Catholicism. Everyone can see him, what he's doing in plain sight, yet we do nothing to stop him. And I think Shakespeare's play, Richard III, right. asks exactly the same questions of the audience. Richard comes on stage, tells us he's going to murder his wife, he's going to murder his nephews, he's going to have his brother George killed, he's going to get this other guy killed. And we just find ourselves as an audience laughing along with his jokes. Mm -hmm. And you sort of feel like, actually, this guy's all right. And by Bosworth, you might even almost want him to win. Well, what does that say about us as an audience that we're watching this guy literally, you know, as I said before, wade through blood to right. get to the throne and we're laughing at his jokes and we're going along with it. I think Shakespeare would have been asking a, a contemporary Elizabethan audience whether that's not what they're doing with Robert Cecil. Yeah, but that is, a, I mean, isn't that true? I mean, it goes back through history that humanity likes blood, humanity likes violence. I mean, look at, you know, ancient Rome and the gladiator battles. That was to take people's mind off of what was actually going on with them. But they loved it. You know, kill, 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 and all that. So to me, that's a normal thing. So I, I can kind of see why Richard was put in, you know, written into this light, because pe people like it. So why not play into it? Absolutely. You know, again, what does it say about us that we like that kind of thing mm -hmm. quite so much? We, we like murderous people who seem to be getting away with it, although ultimately mm -hmm. they get their comeuppance at the end mm -hmm. of the story. Well, look at this recent um, submarine thing that happened. 
I mean, look how many memes. I don't know if you're on TikTok or, or what, but I was shocked at how many people, even while they were still missing, came out with these humorous, funny memes. Because people, yeah, I mean, it, people, uh, I don't get it. No, it's so distasteful. You know, they, they were, that's literally laughing at people while they're dying. It's pretty disgusting yeah. to me. But whoever Absolutely. they are, you know, people people think they're fair game because they're rich or whatever else. They're still mm -hmm. human beings and they've still got families. Absolutely. Just, just cruel. And to think that his wife and daughter were on that, uh, uh, you know, on the main boat when all this was going on. I mean, it's just it's heartbreaking. But anyway, it does, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that I think, you know, like, like, like you say, this – this uh, watching somebody else get killed or kill somebody, people like that stuff because, it, it, like I said, going back to what I said about the submarine and all this, it takes them away from their, their own troubles. Yeah, you know? it's always nice to see someone else who's having a harder time than you are. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Do you think Richard was as bad as they say? I don't think he was. I think we see throughout the 16th century, his reputation get worse and worse and become hardened. And to some extent, you can trace the growth of the story through all of the chronicles that are written. So from Virgil to Moore, to Edward Hall, to Raphael Hollinshed, who was you know a big source for Shakespeare and it kind of reaches mm -hmm. its pinnacle at Shakespeare. All of these people are writing books and trying to sell them. So when you write a new version of those events, you've kind of got to add something. Otherwise, why would anyone buy your book? So right. Richard becomes a little bit nastier and he becomes guilty of another crime. And they try and put thoughts into his mind and words into his mouth that they can't possibly have have known was what he was thinking or saying, because mm -hmm. that's what audiences want to read. They want their villains to be a bit more villainous. They mm -hmm. want the bad guy to be even worse. And you, you can really see that story around Richard crystallizing throughout the, the 16th century. What I see in Richard is a man who was interested in justice, equity, law and order. We have lots of, of legal cases during his time as, as Duke of Gloucester in the north, in which, as I say, he intervenes, <clears throat> excuse me, he intervenes on behalf of those lower down the social scale when that simply wasn't the done thing. You know, you mm -hmm. backed the people further up the social scale, you backed the people who were members of your affinity. There's one murder case when three brothers and a father in his service are accused of murder and they they're accused of murder. And then they go and enter the service of Richard, believing that that will protect them from any repercussions mm -hmm. for that murder, because now they're in the service of a great Lord. He'll protect them. But Richard doesn't know that the three brothers abscond, but he has the father sent to jail in York to face charges for what he's done. So I see a man who is, is very interested in equity and that continues as king. His parliament while he's king is one of the most striking parts of his reign that never, ever gets talked about. It's a, there's a genuine lasting legacy in that parliament around reforms to bail, reforms to jury composition, uh, the creation of an early form of legal aid so that people who couldn't afford to bring legal cases could still have their day in court and there would be a fund to pay for these things. He's improving the lot of the common man at almost every step. And the, the issue, I think, is that when he's king, to give power and to give rights to the common man, you have to take them away from other people. You have mm -hmm. to take them away from the kind of the gentry classes in particular. And those are the people that rebel against Richard, particularly in October 1483, and then who join Henry Tudor in 1485. So I think you can make an argument that Richard didn't fall because he was nasty, in mm -hmm. some ways, he fell perhaps because he was too nice, but he was nice in the wrong way to people that that those further up the social scale with any kind of power wouldn't tolerate. Well, you know, when you also look at this, too, for a ruler like that, in a way, having a nasty reputation could be a good thing. Because Absolutely. People it's one of those things, you know. Do you want to be respected or feared? You know, if you mm -hmm. if you can't be loved, it's Machiavelli, isn't it? If you know, if you can't be loved, it's better to be feared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that Richard ever does anything that that seems to have an apparent aim of wanting to make him feared. Possibly, mm -hmm. with the exception of the execution of of Hastings, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't see any of his actions as trying to cause people to be terrified of him. Um. It, and that's just not part of his makeup in the previous 30 years either. It just doesn't seem to be how he operates. But at some point, he did get to the throne. You know, whether it was 
whether it was legitimate or not, but he, he did make it. You know, he got he got what he wanted to that. Um, what happened to his brother and stuff? To those people? Um, to to so Richard's brothers, uh, he had three older brothers. Edmund is the second brother. He dies at the Battle of Wakefield in 1460 alongside their father. Uh, the brother that was closest to him in age, his older brother George, was okay. executed by Edward IV in 1478. Okay. And then his his other brother, Edward IV, the king, dies on the 9th of April, 1483, which is what launches that kind of whole problematic period. Okay. And so Richard then... The heir to the throne is is Edward the Fourth's oldest son, who is proclaimed as Edward the Fifth. He's a twelve year old boy. He's at Ludlow Castle, so again near me, um, when his father dies and begins to make his way to London. And we know over the weeks that follow that Richard would take Edward into his own custody. He appeared to have feared a Woodville plot, which there is there is evidence that they were up to something. I think uh -huh. he arrests Earl Rivers, who was taking care of Edward the Fifth takes custody of Edward V, takes him to London, and both before Richard leaves the North and when he arrives in London, he causes people to swear oaths of loyalty to Edward V as the rightful king. Mm -hmm. So, and again, what happens next is kind of always going to depend on your view of Richard because we just don't have the evidence to say definitively right, right. what happened and why. So the, there's a traditional view that says possibly as early as... as when he takes custody of Edward V at Stony Stratford, Richard decides he's going to make himself king. And so that everything that follows is him clearing the path to the throne. He executes Hastings as a supporter of Edward V. He executes um, Earl Rivers and Richard Grey as family members of Edward V, who he might have looked to for advice. And then ultimately he, in the traditional version, he invents this story that Edward IV was married bigamously to have... The, the princes in the tower, as they would become known, uh -huh. declared illegitimate. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You can read those events in another way in which Richard kind of stumbles through this incredibly difficult period where there are, uh, there are people fighting in the streets of London before Richard even arrives. Hastings faction and the Woodville faction have armed men in the streets of London before Richard gets anywhere near the capital. Uh -huh. So he didn't cause trouble. In many ways, he was seen as the, the solution. So you can see him stumbling through this really thorny, difficult period of events from crisis to crisis, desperately doing his best until he thinks the only way that I can solve this is just to make myself king and, and have some power. Mm -hmm. and, and to some extent, that view plays into that idea that I mentioned before about Richard being uncomfortable with, with a lack of security and a lack of certainty from his childhood. So you can definitely play out that version of events. But I think there's also a version of 1483 in which Richard is a much more genuine operator when some of these issues are, are isolated incidents that aren't connected in that way, that, that's uh -huh. sort of this unbroken thread that leads him to the throne. Uh -huh. For example, Hastings. So on the 13th of June, Lord Hastings is kind of dragged out of a, a council meeting at the Tower and beheaded inside the Tower of London. Wow. Lots of people wow. say he didn't have a trial. Yeah. Yeah, lots of people will say that Hastings didn't have a trial. Mm -hmm. There's a complicated issue there in that Richard, as Constable of England at the time, had the power to convene a court's martial for treason based on evidence that he'd seen. He could act as judge, jury, and order an execution. There was no right of appeal. It's pretty mm -hmm. draconian, but those were powers that he'd held for kind of 15 years as Constable mm -hmm. of England and that he understood well. So there is an argument that Hastings had a trial for treason and was judicially executed. What was that treason? Again, it's possible to see those who were gathered at that council meeting, a small meeting, were all still in receipt of a pension from the King of France following Edward IV's invasion of France in 1475, for which he was paid off effectively. As Edward IV was dying, Louis XI of France was, was kind of reinitiating hostilities. He was raiding... Uh, British English shipping in the, the English Channel. He was attacking the south coast of England. The campaign to Scotland that I spoke about earlier in 1482 may well have been a precursor to this building hostility from France as part of that old alliance between Scotland and France. And we know that Hastings had also said that if the Woodvilles were allowed to remain in power, he would go to Calais 
and barricade himself in there and find a way to fight the the Woodvilles. On top of that, we know that during this period, uh, a ship full of cash was seized on the south coast of England. Coming from France, no one knows what that cash was for, where it came from or where it was going. So if you put all of those pieces of a jigsaw together, it's possible that what Richard saw was people who were in the pocket of the King of France, mm -hmm. who were threatening to go to France at a time when France was becoming hostile to England, who were potentially receiving funds from the King of France in, in the form of a shipload of money to further their efforts to get control of the government of England. So Richard could well have seen that as collusion with the enemy, as, as treason in that right. sense, that Hastings was now becoming a dangerous liability. And so therefore he's tried for treason, found guilty. And if you're guilty of treason, you get executed. That so it's sense. possible. You know, there, are, there are several ways to interpret what happens with Hastings. I mm -hmm. think people have a tendency just to rush through the idea that Richard was plowing away to the throne through all of mm -hmm. these people mm -hmm. that get out of the way. And that, that you need to sometimes think about whether we could separate those events into different moments that culminate in the same thing, but not in the same way. Now, you mentioned the princes in the tower. Tell, tell me a little bit about how that came about. So Edward V, as I said, is proclaimed king, gets to London, is installed initially at the Bishop of London's palace and then in the Tower of London. And at this point, when he's put there, there's nothing sinister about this. The Tower of London is a, a royal palace. It's where medieval monarchs go to prepare for their coronation. So there is nothing unusual or sinister in Edward's going to the Tower of London in the first instance. Uh -huh. His younger brother, Richard, Duke of York, is nine years old at this point. When Richard takes control of the person of Edward V, the prince's mother, Elizabeth Woodville, so the widow of Edward IV, takes uh, her, her other son, Richard, all of her daughters, and also her son from her first marriage, a man named Thomas Gray, the Marquis of Dorset. She takes uh -huh. them into sanctuary at Westminster Abbey. And then we're told that the council complains to Richard that he isn't, you know, talking to Elizabeth Woodville and convincing her to come out of sanctuary. Uh -huh. We then get some negotiations. There's some suggestion that Richard has men surrounding sanctuary and, and that this is a threat of violence that he might breach sanctuary. But it's also in the in the context of the fact that Thomas Gray, the Marquis of Dorset, flees from sanctuary in a desperate attempt to get to the continent. So we know that people are trying to get out of sanctuary. So these people could be guarding the streets rather than being a threatening, oppressive force. Mm -hmm. And we also know that Margaret Beaufort's physician, a man named Lewis Kerleon, is going into sanctuary to visit Elizabeth Woodville and make plans. So Richard would have good reason to be suspicious about who's going in and out of that sanctuary. Right. Right. It's not necessarily the case that he was threatening to breach the sanctuary at all. Ultimately, it's the Archbishop of Canterbury who goes in talks to Elizabeth Woodville, asks for Richard, Duke of York, to be allowed to join his brother in the tower to prepare for the coronation because it's proper that he should be there. Okay. And the Archbishop of Canterbury vouches for Richard, the, the older Richard. There's uh -huh. another Richard. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury vouches for Richard and says, you know, I will guarantee that nothing, no harm will come to this boy. And it's interesting, I think, that the Archbishop of Canterbury never feels the need to say, crikey, I got that wrong. I'm so sorry. Uh -huh. You know, I need to make amends for, for giving this, this vow. He never, ever does that. Uh -huh. um, so Richard goes to join his brother in the Tower of London. The, the last date that was set for Richard for Edward V's cor coronation was the 22nd of June. And it seems that some point in the week leading up to that, a story emerges that Edward IV had been married before he married Elizabeth Woodville to a lady named Eleanor Butler. And that first marriage makes the second one bigamous. Mm -hmm. Bigamy makes the children from that marriage illegitimate. Mm -hmm. And under canon law, illegitimate children can't succeed to the throne. So there, that is a hard rule. Doesn't necessarily apply amongst the rest of the nobility, but when you're talking about becoming a king, it's, it's an absolute rule, no mm -hmm. illegitimate children. Mm -hmm. And again, so that's the, that's the bare bones of what happens. That story emerges. The Chronicles tell us that evidence of it is examined. Edward IV's children are declared illegitimate. They then think about who's next in line to the throne. It could be 
the Edward Earl of Warwick, who is the son of Richard's older brother, George. Uh -huh. So arguably has a, a, a senior claim. Warwick's issue is that when George is tried for treason and executed, he's attainted in Parliament and him and all of his children and their descendants are specifically barred from ever claiming the throne. So well, Warwick is still legally unable to become king following that 1478 Act of Parliament. And so the next heir is Richard. He's the, the only other remaining son of Richard, Duke of York. He's the only remaining brother of Edward IV. He's the next male heir of the House of York. And so, as I say, you know, that, that's the bare facts of how Richard mm -hmm. becomes king. Again, it's down to how you interpret it and what you think right. his motives were during that period. Lots of people will say that that bigamy story is a plant. It's a fake. It's a fraud. Mm -hmm. I'm not so convinced. I mean, when wow. Edward IV marries Elizabeth Woodville, he does it in secret and keeps it secret for several months before he tells anybody about it. So the idea that Edward could marry in secret is utterly believable because we know he did it with Elizabeth Woodville. Right. Is it impossible that he did it before as a way to get a woman into bed? Plenty of people at the time, I think, wouldn't have thought that that was impossible. Mm -hmm. We know that people examine evidence of this. We don't know what that evidence is, I presume, because it's destroyed when Henry VII comes to the throne. And he has to re-legitimise Edward IV's children because he wants to marry, needs to marry Edward IV's daughter, Elizabeth. So we can't see that evidence. We know it was accepted in 1483, but we can't see it now. Yet people will say it's fraudulent without being able to examine that or, or understand in what way it might be fraudulent. One of the big arguments, I think, around the illegitimacy story, the bigamy story, is that it was way too convenient for Richard to be true that it should uh -huh. emerge at this time. I mean, I'd, I'd suggest two things. I'd suggest it's not very convenient for a man who has sworn oaths of allegiance to Edward V and caused everybody else in the kingdom to swear oaths of allegiance, uh -huh. to a man who is minting coin in the name of Edward V, making proclamations in his name, preparing for his coronation. It's not very convenient for this story to suddenly emerge. Right. But I'd also suggest that this story... I don't see a situation in which this story could have come out before the death of Edward IV. Mm -hmm. There is a strong suggestion that this story may have been part of the reason why George was executed in 1478, that he was threatening to bring this story into the light. And so if Edward IV would execute his own brother for, mm -hmm. for threatening to make this story public, who else during the life of Edward IV is going to come out and say, I know this? Right. It's a guaranteed death sentence. So in many ways, I think it needed, if the story is true, and that, that is a big if, uh -huh. if the story is true, it needed Edward IV to be dead for it to come into the light. And I think that's why the timing is what it is. And that's why, far from being convenient for Richard, for Richard it's actually incredibly inconvenient. Uh -huh. Well, what happened to the two princes? I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of speculation out there that that, that they were executed, and they were bur you know, buried somewhere on the grounds, or, or they're, they're stuck in the wall in the castle. Or, or what do you think happened to them? Yeah. So again, we lack any evidence to be certain. So we're into right. the realms of speculation and, and opinion. Right. So lots of people do think they were murdered, uh -huh. either by by Richard the Third on the orders of Richard the Third, possibly by the Duke of Buckingham. Mm -hmm. um and you know other suspects abound and i think um nathan amin who's a friend of mine always says that the unfortunate thing for the the princes in 1483 is that with the exception of their mother almost everybody else in england had a vested interest in them being dead everyone else could be given a reason to want them out of the way wow john howard becomes duke of norfolk which was a title that had belonged to the younger of the princes so he had a, a reason to want him out of the way my theory is simply that in, in Richard, I don't see a man whose first response to a crisis is to murder two small children, mm -hmm. let alone his nephews, who are the sons of a brother who I think he saw as very much as a father figure, mm -hmm. who he's been loyal to for more than a decade. I think he would have at least tried something else. Mm -hmm. I think you know, my, my own interpretation of what may have happened is that I think the boys would have been separated. They grew up completely separate. 
Oh. Edward V could well have gone to the, the household of the Council of the North in the north of England, where Richard has castles filled with men who've been utterly loyal to him for, for more than a decade, oh. where he is, is well liked and he knows who he can trust. And I think perhaps the younger one, Richard, could have gone over to Burgundy, where Richard's sister, Margaret, was the Dowager Duchess of Burgundy. So has lots of power at court and is able to perhaps care for her nephew and bring him up sort of out of the limelight over there. Um, I then think part of, part of the reason that I doubt Richard killed them as well is simply that if he killed them or had them killed, it's so that they can never be a threat to him. Right. But in order to achieve that, he needs everyone to know that they're dead. Everyone has to understand that they're dead and they can't be a threat. But nobody ever knows that. That's the reason they continue to be a threat throughout Henry VII's reign. You look at Perkin Warbeck in the 1490s. Uh -huh. How was he able to even claim to be the younger of the princes in the tower if everybody knew that that boy was dead and nobody believed that they were alive? Wow. So yeah. for me, if Richard killed them and then kept quiet about it, he does it for no gain. So I think the boys survived his reign. I think Edward V emerges again in 1487 in what we remember as the Lambert Simnel affair, uh -huh. which is traditionally believed to be about Edward, Earl of Warwick. But I kind of think the Tudor government used that fact that annoys all historians and anyone who tries to study the Wars of the Roses, that everyone is called Edward or Richard. Right. And there's an Edward emerging in Ireland and, and he just says, well, I've got an Edward over here in prison, so it can't be him. And they kind of saw smoke and mirrors and they make a bit of a mess of it. And I think I think there is good reason to believe that the person we remember as Perkin Warbeck could well have been the younger of the princes in the tower. Um, and I, so that's that's my personal belief. But I think what I dislike about the traditional view of the fate of the princes in the tower is that people tend to view it as black and white, a closed book, a done deal. Right absolutely no nuance around it so i don't i don't ever claim to have solved the mystery i don't claim that my version is right right all right, i right. say is that i think there is lots of room to think more closely about what happened than the tr mm -hmm. traditional view normally does mm -hmm. now let's look at richard as a ruler how did the people adapt to him or, or how, how do they feel about him in terms of and again this varies so mm -hmm. the the nobility are largely loyal to Richard. We don't find anybody amongst the nobility who who abandons Richard. Mm -hmm. The common people seem to love Richard, and we know from that track record in the north that he has a good history of of taking care of the common people and appealing to them and, and doing things that are for their benefit. So, for example, we have a a quote from the the Bishop of St David's who talks about Richard on his progress being rapturously welcomed by crowds who thank him for for improving their lot and he he deals with legal cases in person um he gives lots of land that's been taken uh, as royal forest land and gives it back to the people as common land um and and the bishop of saint david says that you know wherever he goes the people offer him money so when he enters a town they'll offer him money and presents and he refuses it he refuses these gifts and said he doesn't want their money he wants their love okay so that, you know this is not a man who is trying to rule by fear he's not extracting anything from his people i think where his issue lies is the bit between the nobility and the common people that kind of gentry class uh -huh. richard becomes king very much on a, an anti-corruption ticket and all of the people that we see rebel against him in 1483 and as I said, who then join Henry Tudor on the continent and return to Bosworth in 1485, are from that southern kind of middling gentry who would have done quite well out of the corruption under Edward IV's reign. They were lining their pockets quite nicely. So when Richard comes along and says, you can't do that anymore, I think that's the reason that these people turn against him. People will often say, you know, he falls at Bosworth because people were so disgusted about the idea that the princes in the tower might have been murdered that they won't tolerate this man anymore. I simply don't buy that. I don't think very many people took to that field on the 22nd of August, 1485, thinking I'm going to avenge two boys who may or may not be dead, who may right. or may not need avenging. But no one wants to go onto a battlefield and say, you know, no one has a placard saying, I want my corruption back. Uh -huh. okay. So I think that's what they wanted. I think perhaps the, the fate of the princes in the tower becomes a chivalric cloak that they can throw over these slightly murky 
motivations for being mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So we, we see, I think Richard is popular with the top of society and the bottom of society. His problem lies mm -hmm. in the middle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there any kind of legislation that he, he, he allowed to pass that's notable? Absolutely. So Richard has one parliament that sits in January and February 1484. Mm -hmm. And there are there are commentators ever since who have said, you know, this is this parliament was remarkable. And as I said before, I think this is where we can see a real lasting legacy of Richard. So people people have said for a long time that Richard invented bail. He definitely didn't. Bail had been around for, for hundreds of years by this point. What Richard does to bail is reform the system. So he tightens up the rules around um, stopping people being denied bail, for one thing. But he also changes the system so that previously, if I were to accuse you of a crime and you were arrested, the sheriff would seize all of your property and all of your goods at the time of your arrest. Right. If you were then found innocent, there is no requirement to give you that stuff back. And that, that could be the tools of your trade. It could be the way you make a living, how you feed your family. So a malicious accusation could lead to you losing your entire livelihood and put your family wow. in jeopardy. So Richard changes that law to say that you can't seize anybody's property until they've been found guilty in a court of law. It's a pretty significant kind of anti-corruption <laughs> piece of legislation yeah. that, it, that is, is never changed and is a cornerstone of what we think of when we think of bail today. He changes jury composition. And this is one of those things that to a modern eye in, in certainly in the UK, I'm not sure about in the States, but everyone is entitled to sit on a jury. Everyone can can be a juror and be called up for jury duty. Richard changes the law to say that you have to be worth a certain amount of money and live in the county where the court is sitting in order to sit on a jury. And the reason that he does this, it explicitly says in the parliament rolls, is because of the, the huge in, amount of instances of people bribing juries or intimidating and threatening juries to get the results they want in court. Mm -hmm. So Richard removes the ability to bribe or intimidate by saying that these have to be reasonably wealthy, well-positioned men able to, to stand up for themselves in order to appear on a jury. So it kind of that sounds a little bit counterintuitive to us today when everyone has the right to be a juror, but there are good right. reasons that Richard does it. Um, he creates this early form of legal aid, as I mentioned before. So people who can't afford to to pay for lawyers and to pay for their day in court, they can dip into this fund of money that will allow them to get access to law. You know, if you think Richard is a monstrous tyrant, why is he opening up access to right. the law? Right, right, it's right. not something you would expect a tyrant to do. Um, there are several other things that appear amongst all of that as well. There, there is. Um, he introduces quite isolationist trade laws, which isn't unusual for the time at all. Uh, he particularly targets Italian merchants. He seems to have had something against Italian merchants. Mm -hmm. But he specifically excludes books and the book trade from any of these restrictive um, laws so that books can be imported you know, freely and, and can move around the country. And, and again, you wouldn't expect a tyrant to be interested in the free dissemination of information and right. literature they would tend to want to control that but richard does the opposite um and one of the most striking things i would say as well is that this is the first parliament richard the third parliament in 1484 is the first parliament that ever publishes its laws in english oh. up until that point they've been published in latin perhaps french so that only the elite ruling class can understand what the law is sure yeah. In a world which is becoming increasingly literate with a, a burgeoning merchant class, literacy is, is on the rise. Richard publishes his laws in English so that English people can understand what their law is. You don't need to go to a member of the elite to have this law explained or told or translated to you okay. and, and without knowing whether they're telling you the truth or not. You can go to a statute book and you can read your law that governs your life that your king has given to you. And again, I would argue that opening up that kind of access to to the law is not in the interests of a tyrant. You know, they tend to want to control everything and shut down information rather than spread it around and make it freely available. So there are a lot of striking things about Richard's Parliament. Many of those laws that he passes were never undone. You know, he oh. abolishes 
um, a form of taxation called benevolences, which his brother had kind of invented. And they were essentially forced gifts to the crown. So a tax collector would knock on your door and say, the king wants $100 from you today. And you couldn't say no, and you didn't get it back. Richard abolishes that and says, you know, I'm not going to resort to that. I'm going to live by my own means. I'm going to work with Parliament, which is the proper place to grant taxation. Right. And so he abolishes benevolences. And we even get a case in the 1520s where Cardinal Wolsey goes to the people of London and says, Henry VIII is, is enacting a benevolence. He wants all this money from you. And the citizens of London say, you can't do that. Richard III made it illegal. We're protected by law. So there are, there are a number of things that are really striking about that parliament. And, and that's where I think you can find some of Richard's enduring legacy, because some of that stuff is never undone. Um, overall, you know, when you look back on history, how, how do you see him in his place in history? I think it's hard. You know, I'm a Ricardian. I, I believe that Richard III has been given a bad hand by history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I think it's hard not to admit that he was a failure as a king. I think he could have been a really good king. The fact is, I think he had good motivations for the things that he did. Mm -hmm. He clearly went about it in the wrong way. He alienated people who were powerful enough to remove him from the throne. Whether, even whether you believe that that's because of the, his approach to law and justice or because he murdered the princes in the tower. Kind of either way, what he did was alienate people who were powerful enough to make him pay for that. I think... So I think you know he had good motives and he was trying to do good things, but he did it in a bad way. He loses his crown after two years, dies in battle without an heir, and ends you know, 332 years of the Plantagenet dynasty. That's a pretty dreadful resume for a, a medieval king. Uh -huh. But I still think history has, has dealt him a, a harsh hand. I think, I think he fell for reasons other than what tradition thinks. I think he's convicted of things based on very, very little evidence that amounts to, to little more than hearsay with very little consideration ever given to other interpretations and options. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think he was a good man who did a bad job as king. Okay, okay. Do you think that history will ever be kind to him? I mean, I, because, you know, all, all these years, there's people like you out, right, out, <clears throat> out writing these books. Do you think that there's ever going to be a time when people look at him differently? I don't know. I think it depends because the, because the difficulty remains that utter lack of of clear evidence for what happened, particularly mm -hmm. in the summer of 1483. So unless new evidence emerges, which everyone is comfortable, you know, rallying around and saying we believe this source and it says A or B, you know, I don't know which version of events that is. As I said, I'm a Ricardian, but that doesn't mean I would ignore evidence. Uh -huh. um, if Richard turns out to have been a child killing monster, then I will think I've wasted an awful lot of time um, trying to argue to the contrary. Uh -huh. But also I think there's a lot of value in just examining a person more deeply. And, and, you know, there are facets of Richard that we can prove things like his parliament that are hard to explain as a, a child killing tyrannical monsters work. Uh -huh. So I think it depends what evidence might emerge. I think to some extent, having lived through an uh, <clears throat> having lived through an era of fake news, it becomes easier for people to understand how these stories can be propagated with very little evidence. Right. If right. the government tells you something over and over and over again, some people will just believe that. Uh -huh. I think we're we're more questioning of that now, having lived through that kind of era of fake news, and that can be applied to Richard the uh Third. -huh. It's just critically assessing what we told instead of just accepting what what history has always told us about richard the third critically assess it we think he's a child killer why do we think that there's, there's no evidence that the children were even killed never mind by richard right that doesn't mean he didn't do it you know i will always say there is a a very strong chance that richard killed the princes in the tower mm -hmm. i can't prove that he didn't i simply don't see that as the way that richard would behave if the boys died in 1483, he's absolutely the prime suspect. But that doesn't mean they did die, and it doesn't mean he did it. Right. Um, right. So I, I think history may be growing kinder to Richard to some extent because of the world that we're living in today. 
because history is all about empathy. It's about understanding someone's story. It's about caring enough to to look a little bit deeper, to scratch the surface and to find out what's going on underneath. And I think perhaps we're getting a bit better at that now. And, and maybe that will apply to people like Richard III from history. One last question. Um, you're standing... <laughs> You're standing on, on 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 the main strip in Las Vegas, and uh, you got your book, Richard the Third, the fact or fiction one. And there's other people who also have books on Richard the Third. How do you get people to read your book? Oh, I think I would sell it as an expose. You know, here here are here is the truth behind 500 years of lies. Mm -hmm. You you've believed what you've been told for 500 years based on very little evidence. Well, here is the proof that that requires questioning. It may not be proof that Richard was innocent of everything history's accused him of, but there is proof in those pages that there is much more to that story than you've ever heard before. Okay, great. Matt, I want to thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. This hour went by like crazy. I'm so fascinated by this stuff. Uh, thank and you very really much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. I would love to have you back on at some other point to talk more about some of your other books, the War of the Rose, you know, the, the 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 War of Roses. I would love to talk about that, you know, go into detail about that. Um, how how can people find you? Uh, I am on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram far too much. Uh, I'm on Twitter <laughs> and Facebook as Matt Lewis author. I'm on Instagram as Matt Lewis history because for some reason I went with a different handle on Instagram, which was stupid in hindsight. Um, I host uh, a podcast called Gone Medieval for a history hit. So we cover anything from the year 500 to 1500, all points in between, um, stories of kings, queens, battles, but also of everyday life and unusual stories that you may not have heard before. So you can find that wherever you get your podcast from. It's called Gone Medieval. And uh, I am also, I work for History Hit as a presenter as well. So I make documentaries. I made one about the princes in the tower. Awesome. Um, awesome. and several other bits and pieces around. I currently got a series coming out on Castle. So the first one came out um, a few weeks ago on Bambra Castle. There is one out on Thursday this week on Ludlow Castle, which is my favourite castle in the world. So I get to go and explain to everyone why I love it so much there. Um, so yeah, you can find me at History Hit on the Gone Medieval podcast or on social media anywhere. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on here again. And I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch. I, like I said, I'd love to get you on to talk about other stuff. Yeah, anytime. Thank you very much for having me. Right. You have a great evening. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. All right. That was really cool. I love medieval history. I'm going to have a drink of water here. It's warm in here. I love I love medieval history and, and studying all that, you know. And uh, wow, that's all I can say. Okay, gang, <clears throat> tomorrow we're shifting gears back to paranormal, back to cryptids. Our good friend Arla Caltech is going to be with us, and she's going to be talking about her life with the Sasquatch. She has a very unique life, um, a natural life, where she believes that the Sasquatch are communicating with her in, 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 in subtle ways. And it's interesting to see, because I, I see her posts every day online, and it's, it's really cool. So, you know, so some of the stuff that, 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 that she's showing online. So she's going to be with us. We'll be, we'll be back at our usual time at 6.30 p.m. Pacific tomorrow. So uh, be looking out for that. And again, uh, if you're watching from Facebook and you like what you see and you, uh, you and you haven't done so already, I'm sorry, but I'm kind of slow today, and you haven't done so already, please follow. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a happy face, that kind of thing. Because what it does is it puts us up in the algorithm. There's an algorithm on Facebook. There's an algorithm on TikTok. There's an algorithm on YouTube. So the more thumbs up and happy faces we get, the the, the more Facebook distributes us out. Okay? So, and that's the same thing for YouTube. And also, if you're watching from YouTube and you like what you saw today, please be sure to hit that, that subscribe button. It doesn't cost anything to subscribe, right? Okay. All right. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bug off now because I uh, have things to do. And I apologize for the dog in the background. He's senile. He's... He's almost 18, so he has his moments. But uh, thanks, thank you, everybody, for coming. And for those of you that are just getting home from work, which will be later on when, when you see this show, thank you for watching. I'll see you guys tomorrow, 6.30 p.m. Pacific. Have a great one.